history of sociology rests on the discipline's authoritative texts, thinkers, and theories. Elementary forms of religious life, Durkheim, Das Kapital, Marx, the Protestant ethic, Weber. But some contend this canon of founders is less than complete. Where are the women? I mean, where are the women? We know they were here. We know they existed. So where are they now? The only rational conclusion I can come to is they were taken by aliens. Those not completely out of touch with reality view this erasure from the record of sociological history as political. These intelligent, industrious women and their legacies were marginalized by the patriarchy and diminished by male privilege, no question. But I must wonder if their choice of transcendence over imminence in de Beauvoir's typology in fact presented such an affront to established gender roles that their exclusion from the canon by males was born of sexism, sheerly of spite. Further, early 20th century academic sociology concerned itself with scientific objective investigation, not critical and ethnographic research. These women were critics, activists, advocates, reformers, prophets of civil religion. They weren't sitting on their thumbs constructing abstractions of how things are. They cared how things should be. Just who were these women, and why do they warrant remembering? Harriet Martineau was born in 1802 in Norwich, England. Martineau was a sickly child and lost all hearing as a teenager. Her poor health, however, did not impede upon her intellectual precocity. By 14, Martineau was versed in the works of the preeminent scholars of the day, such as Adam Smith. Harriet? Was that the lady who wrote the Uncle Tom's Cabin in the Woods by the lake? After early disappointments, Martineau gained prominence within literary circles with the 1832 publication of Illustrations of Political Economy, a series of stories illustrating political and economic principles. This is where I call shenanigans. Within two years, she's selling 10,000 copies a month while Charles Dickens is selling, what, two or three thousand? So she's not erased from the record due to toiling away in obscurity during her lifetime, that's for sure. In 1834, the best-selling author traveled to the United States. For two years, Martineau traversed the young nation, interviewing everyone from President Jackson to slave owners. Okay, so is it the underground model railroad lady then? Why do you have me here? Her travels produced her best-known works, Society in America and How to Observe Morals and Manners. The former would, however, be overshadowed by a contemporary pioneer in sociology also writing about the United States. Society in America was published in 1836. A year prior, Alexis de Tocqueville had published Democracy in America. Whether it was her gender or her much more critical stance towards American society, de Tocqueville's book became an instant classic while hers faded into obscurity for 150 years. During a five-year period suffering an undisclosed illness, Martineau penned an account of life as an invalid in the sick room. After recovery, she extensively edited and translated Auguste Comte's positive philosophy into English. Until recently, Sociology has not much regarded Martineau beyond the role of Coates' translator. For Martineau, sociology consisted of figuring out how a society had organized its morals and manners, meaning the prescribed, proscribed behavior versus action association patterns. In society in America, she noted a glaring discrepancy. Morals called for life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, but manners kept women from voting and blacks in slavery. In the modern sociological paradigm of civil religion, Martineau would be the prophetic voice calling out America for violating 
its own beliefs found in the sacred texts such as the Declaration of Independence. Arno's How to Observe Morals and Manners may have well been the very first book to systematically discuss sociological methodology. Her first rule in sociological method was the study of things, those facts that represent the collectivity, social facts. Of course, Durkheim said the same thing 57 years later. In Zygroom is fascinating because it anticipates sociological theories about a century before their formulation. Writing about how, as an invalid, her social identity to non-invalids was nothing but that of an invalid, and the expectations based upon how she was to act as an invalid was basically a recipe for Irvin Goffman's stigma. Martineau was also influential as a feminist speaker in London and, health permitting, throughout the UK. Education concerned her. The prevailing ideology of her day was that women neither needed nor should have too much education. Martineau attacked this construct philosophically on the basis of equality and, in true sociological form, used census data to show how involved women actually were in the labor force thereby demonstrating that their education was not unnecessary. Martineau further pushed for equality of pay and a restructuring of marriage. Martineau condemned the expectation of chastity for women that didn't exist for men, uh, the role of women as playthings or servants, arranged marriage, sexual repression, and the difficulty for women in obtaining a divorce. She held these elements were antithetical to a companionate, satisfactory marriage. Harriet Martineau died in 1876. She wrote her own obituary, reading, She saw the human race advancing under the law of progress. She enjoyed her share of the experience and had no reluctance or anxiety about leaving the enjoyment of such as she had. Tell me it's not worth trying for I can't help it, there's nothing I thought you said this was about Brian Adams Well, <laughs> who the is Jane Adams? Jane Adams was born in Cedarville, Illinois in 1860 Despite a wealth of information on Adams' sociological theory, Adams would be remembered as a social worker rather than sociologist until reclaimed by Mary Jo Deegan. Adams had this idea of bifurcated consciousness. There was the world she saw in the literature that she read in college, and then, traveling Europe after graduation, she saw the real life of the poor. Here she develops this pragmatic view of personal experience over theory, which inevitably emerges in her own theory. Also during her travels in Europe, Adams discovered the social experiments known as settlement houses. In the settlement movement, those of privileged classes moved to poor urban areas. The aim was that the culture of the privileged would be transmitted to the poor, while the volunteers worked to ameliorate the poverty of their neighbors. What the privileged didn't take into account, however, was that all poor people are aliens. In 1889, Adams, alongside Ellen Gates Starr, opened the settlement Hull House in Chicago. Adams and Starr initially viewed themselves as neighbors and bearers of culture in their impoverished neighborhood. However, Hull House soon became a collaborative effort that expanded to a complex of buildings and supplied a wide variety of services. Residence research reform. That was how Adams characterized the settlement movement and that is what the Hull House did. Residence research reform. Still want to say she's not a sociologist? Next you'll be saying she's not a woman. Politically, Adams ran the gamut of roles. She was an activist for labor unions, women's rights, pacifism during the First World War, children, minorities, and the Progressive Party. 
During the 1920s Red Scare, her support for the free speech rights of socialists and anarchists earned her a spot on the FBI's list of most dangerous radicals. In 1931, she was the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. She died four years later. Yet, Jane Addams is just beginning to attain her rightful place in sociological theory. Wait, is it that clown doctor who heals kids with the power of laughter? No, that's Patch Adams. Huh. The construct of the social ethic is the central component of Adams' theory which focuses on social improvement through cooperative efforts. Social knowledge is learned through direct interaction in society. And once you've gained this knowledge, you have an ethical imperative to bring about change in the situation you now know of. For sociologists, Adams called for the neighborly relation, in which the researcher and subject have an authentic, caring relation. It all goes back to this idea of the common lot. One group's well-being can't be sacrificed for the sake of another group. All people have hopes and plans and thoughts and are not just agents for the benefit of some elite group. And as active agents, people will work for the good of their community. And injury to one is an injury to all. Situated vantage points are the social realities we construct from the perspective of our own social position. A necessary cause for the social ethic is the ability to take the vantage point of others. This is why Adam's narratives often present conflicts resulting from collisions of vantage points. Something else that can get in the way of social ethics is belated ethics, which are values that are misaligned with new organizations in society. As in, the ethic of individualism leads to capitalist exploitation, the ethic of family leads to women not contributing to their communities, the ethic of egocentrism leads to a planet that won't be ready when the invasion of the- Charlotte Perkins Gilman was born in Connecticut in 1860 and grew up amidst heated debates regarding women's societal roles. Ideologies such as the cult of true womanhood in which a woman was pious, pure, submissive, and domestic, or combated by political movements for suffrage and more education for women. Charlotte! She's... the lady who was miserable being a wife and mother, but found fulfillment in intellectual pursuits, so she divorced her husband and had her best friend raise her kid, but eventually had a satisfactory marriage with her cousin because he let her work and didn't make her do domestic stuff even though she was really a lesbian? Really? Damn, stab in the dark, man! My next guess was a spider that wrote messages for a pig on webs! Gilman's first marriage, indeed, elicited such anxiety that she was prescribed a rest cure, a 19th century treatment in which she was prohibited from any activity, including reading and writing. The enforced idleness drove Gilman to the brink of mental collapse, and this experience is documented in the autobiographical, albeit fictional, short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. While Gilman would go on to publish over 2,000 pieces of fiction, poetry, novels, and articles in her lifetime, the 1898 publication of Women and Economics, a sociological study on the organization of society based on sex stratification, would establish her as the leading feminist intellectual. Interesting thing about Gilman is that she really was a theorist in the early 20th century sense of the word. A critical one, for sure, but her objective and personal approach to formal theorizing and social analysis approximates those of Weber, Durkheim, Zimmel. You could say she was an activist, but in a very academic sense. She traveled and lectured incessantly, but ran no settlement houses. 
After World War I, the once highly influential Gilman was left without an audience. Much of her theory hinged on reform sociology, an offshoot of progressivism, which, post-war, was preempted by a return to normalcy. Her ideals of gender equality were lost on those who considered the matter settled by the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Bitter and ill with inoperable breast cancer, Gilman took her own life in 1935. Yet, Gilman's theoretical contributions, even if marginalized from general sociology, maintained lasting relevance within feminist paradigms. The basis of women in economics is the sexual-economic relation. For Gilman, gender is social, not biological. Gender inequality is the practice that explains most social pathologies from war to systemic human alienation. Women are the subordinated beings, men are the master class, and this arrangement makes everyone unhappy because humans need meaningful work to even truly be human. This androcentric culture is created by man's need for sociability with an other. He uses maternity to appropriate all economic agency, creating gender roles of aggressiveness for the man and compliance for the woman. Through socialization, these roles are perpetuated continuously. I think where Gilman loses a lot of people is her utopian scenario, which was the dismantling of the whole institution of the household. Women need to be economically emancipated, there's communal housing where people can get married but they're not dependent upon each other, and women work outside the home while domestic work is left to those who find their calling in it. It's a little out there, but I seem to remember a certain slightly unhinged German with not two different ideas who does not get excluded from sociology textbooks for it. Next time on The Sex Sociology Forgot, Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells Barnett on the foundations of black feminist sociology, Marianne Weber on a woman-centered sociology, and Beatrice Potter Webb on sociology as critical positivism. Aliens. All of them. I think where Gilman loses a lot of people is her utopian scenario, which was a dismantling of the whole institution of the household. Women need to be economically emancipated, there's communal housing where people can get married but they're not dependent upon each other, and women work outside the home while domestic work is left to those who find their calling in it. It's a little out there, but I seem to remember a certain slightly unhinged German with not two different ideas who doesn't get excluded from te so blah, 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 blah. Jeez. Oh. It's, it's not a good look for me. Where are the women? I mean, where are the women? We know they were here. We know they existed. So where are they now? The only rational conclusion I can come to is they were taken by aliens. Society in America was published in 1836. A year prior, Alexis de Tocqueville had published Democracy in America. Whether it was her gender or her much more critical stance towards American society, de Tocqueville's book became an instant classic while hers faded into obscurity for 150 years. The basis of women in economics is the sexo-economic relation. What the fuck are you doing? Don't fuck it back there. <laughs> Sit! Wait! I'm Can almost... Walk? No! No! Okay, you don't understand how sense... Okay. Social knowledge is learned directly through interaction in society and once you have this knowledge you have the ethical imperative to bring about change in the situation of which you now know of. Adams for sociologist also, huh? My God, this is never gonna be finished. 
I curse you, classical theory. I curse thee!